Hello everybody, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever in the beautiful world you are. Welcome to Aquarius Rising Africa and it's Wednesday with our beautiful Jessie. But before we move on to Jessie, we have a sponsor for our show today who is Spooky 2, our beautiful sponsor that um, is in China, the our little energy machines, and particularly this week, um, is the little mini magic, which is, in fact, um, I do believe I feature in the ad halfway through, uh, so I'm not going to say too much about that now, but really is an incredible little machine that if you have acute pain, works with vibrations, work with frequencies. My mom's been working with mine, my friend who's had a bad fall, and literally had to actually have surgery on her shoulder and her knee. I uh, didn't, she healed herself and is now doing the rest with this little machine and having incredible results. Really, it's the frequencies, um, amazing. We've been doing interviews with these guys for a while and really incredible. So check it out if you want to, if you guys are interested in uh, looking at that, you can use my name, Chantal, as a coupon code. You get less six percent for the live show, otherwise five percent. So check it out. It's a uh, natural medicine. Uh, the frequencies are really based on frequencies from nature. So really amazing little product. But without further ado, we are here with our beautiful Jessie, and it's wonderful Wednesday, and we are talking the inside of the <laughs> castle and white rabbits today. Now, I've right. always been dying to know, as a little kid, I mean, these castles never stop fascinating me, I'll have you know. So I've been dying to know about what really happens on the inside of the castles. And I know we try to get pics, but it seems the internet has definitely been scrubbed of the inside. But Jess, you explain things so beautifully and that's one thing I've loved listening to you over the years because as you speak, I can really paint the picture in my mind. So I'd love to hear about some of your little stories and things and what it's like there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's interesting that, you know, once you start going to these castles, you know, especially because I was there, you know, during specific times where rituals or certain training things uh, were going on for myself. Um, there was a lot of things that I began to pick up a lot of, um, you know, seeing patterns in the, in the structure and the way, you know, why they built things or per, put things in these castles in certain patterns. Um, some of those things, you know, I, I would notice that every single room had at least one mirror or multiple mirrors. <laughs> and, you know, I soon found out that that was because, you know, these elite use mirrors, um, you know, several different ways. First, they can use it as, you know, kind of that gateway or doorway uh, to access the spirit world. Um, so imagine as a kid, you know, you've seen people use those mirrors to go through them. And the next thing you know, you're someplace that, you know, is not your regular home. Um, you're having to stay at one of these um, castles or, you know, a palace. And, uh, and you've got like three mirrors in your room. And, you know, and, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of times, I would put coverings over them, but even with that, like I knew that that wouldn't keep people out. So there was always just, you know, in everything that I saw there, there was always that sense of never really being safe, never really being alone, um, you know, always having to be on high alert because I never knew what to expect in any situations. Um, now, when you look at the overall layout, um, those rooms with mirrors are very specific. Um, you know, a lot of the ones that are in the bedrooms are used more for monitoring, uh, a witch can stand in any room in the house or even 
farther off, they don't even have to be at that palace. Um, you know, through their magic, they can access those mirrors and use them uh, to view and look and see what's really going on. But they also use it as a form of communication through the spirit world with one another. So they don't even have to go through, they just have to speak to, or, you know, they could go in front of, um, and that's a lot of, you know, they would use the black mirrors to access some of the deeper realms. And, um, you know, as we notice, like, you know, as you go through some of these older castles now or palaces, um, I encourage you look at the glass in the mirrors. Over time, it begins to um, lose the clearness. Like the more those mirrors have been used, uh, they begin to age and you'll notice the, you know, around the edges and stuff, the mirror starts to blacken and kind of get this gray tinty. Uh, so it's no longer like clear glass. And, uh, wow. you know, I think that that's because the, you know, it ref reflects a certain type of light. And as it's being used with our spirits, which are like going in and out, um, you know, it begins to lose all of those ways that it was refracting light in the first place that were so clear and pristine. Um, but in that world, what's more interesting is that, um, you know, the clearer mirrors are not necessarily the more prized mirrors. Um, you know, it's the older mirrors that they, they look for and, you know, usually witches or warlocks will have their mirrors for a very long time and they'll look for like, you know, if they're purchasing mirrors, sometimes they won't go out and buy a brand new one. Um, they will look for those older mirrors. So, um, you know, some of these old fables that we hear like, um, Snow White, uh, that was really the first fairy tale where, you know, the Grimm brothers were bringing out the truth about how the witches use mirrors in their witchcraft. And what do we see in there? You know, the witch spoke to that mirror. Um, they don't talk about the spirit that's behind it, you know, or that's working through it. But basically, you know, mirror shapes were very important. We know in the system and in Solomonic magic that that square, or that rectangular shape um, can also be used on the floor. Uh, you know, like think about foyers or rooms that you walk into in these elite mansions where they have checkered floors. Uh, those are the same squared checkered floors that you see in Masonic lodges. And it's very purposely done because that's their sacred space. And in fact, many of those Masonic lodges will build, um, you know, kind of like a dug out area um, underneath those checkered floors, and they will use that as a ritual uh, doorway to go into another space. Uh, they call those ritual squares, and, you know, that's going to be where they're going to, if they're summoning demonic spirits, they're going to summon through those doors or access points that they put on. Uh, they can also be circular. Um, you know, it just depends on kind of the layout, the design, and the different types of energy flow and magic that they're trying to do. Uh, one of the other things that you see in a lot of these older uh, castles and palaces is you'll see uh, the really dark mahogany wood furniture um, or like the emphasis of that mahogany wood, and you'll see like a red velvet or kind of the, that dark red color um, as the main color for the furniture and uh, the walls. And you'll start to notice like on the wallpaper that, you know, many of them have these designs that, you know, we've come to see is just, oh, it's just a design on the wallpaper. Um, but a lot of those designs were reflective of different meanings in the system. Um, you know, like they would have little, 
you know, florets, like if you think of the floret that I've talked about belongs to the priory. So some of them, you know, will have that floret and then they'll have like another shape that goes up and then like a kind of headpiece so that it almost looks like a woman in a dress. And, and that's purposeful. Um, you know, those became to represent uh, some of the different bloodline families uh, to be able to tell the difference if it was connected to, you know, the Russian, the Italian, the French, or um, the Germans, some of the other main lines. Um, going back to the red furniture, um, that was actually used for very particular things when I was a kid. Um, a lot of times in the studies or um, in weird hallway alcoves, they would put a random, you know, dark wood chair with that red um, coloring on it. And what I would see as a kid was then, you know, at night I would wake up and I, or, you know, like if I was there in a room um, practicing for ritual prep, all of a sudden I would start hearing uh, somebody speaking in a trance and there would just be kind of creepy things that would begin to happen. And as I walked out into those hallways, I would see people uh, sitting in the, those chairs and it, it, whatever it was about that mahogany wood, it allows high level witches and warlocks to be able to cha uh, channel spirits. So they would sit in those chairs and use them for channeling. Uh, so Can that's you, why you see a lot of that. I'm very interested to just ask you this question. Obviously that's happening in castles. Now, I mean, I look at my family and also the old inherited furniture, mm -hmm. um, the mahogany wood, that wallpaper, <laughs> the, <laughs> right. the dodgy mirrors. <laughs> so I'm wondering, does this just happen only in castles or is it possible that if we are seeing this and kind of through just the normal average person in your home with this kind of inherited furniture from 27 generations up type thing and the wallpaper, that creepy, 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 creepy wallpaper. Uh, <laughs> it just gives me the creeps to even think about it. It really, I've never liked it. So when you're talking, it makes, it makes me think. Is that, and especially someone, I was born with, with seeing these things beyond the veil. Right. So I'm wondering, and I used to see a lot. So I'm wondering, help us out there, just for the average person who well, has. What they did was they made it popular. Uh, they begin to mass produce those designs and things. Um, you know, they might use a little bit cheaper wood that's going to go into the average home. Uh, that's where they got into a lot of staining, the the lighter woods uh, with the dark stains, so that people felt like, you know, they had that that cool design that they were seeing, but it was actually, you know, it's like ineffective. It doesn't work the same um, in every situation, you know with the mirrors and actually, you know, they went beyond the mirrors. George and I have talked on the reveal report how, you know, those mirrors then morphed into phones, into TVs. You've got that black screen. Um, you know, they achieved being able to put that not only in the homes of every, you know, the majority of people, but literally where you carry that with you at all times. And why do they do that? So that you can constantly, you know, they know exactly where you're at. They know what you're doing. Um, you know, so it became a form of monitoring. Um, you know, some of the things that I would see was also um, a lot of these old mansions uh, would have a type, they would have a very teeny tiny room. Usually it was off of a staircase or uh, kind of, you know, seemed like a little closet that they would set aside. 
and they would put, um, you know, the older telephones in there. And uh, George and I also have brought out on the reveal report that those initially um, were used for contacting the dead. So uh, those little areas would ironically be very close, either, you know, the <laughs> Um, they would build a room then that would be like this big breakfast uh, alcove. And so somewhere that breakfast alcove would be either above uh, that little phone room or it would be like on the side. It would be somewhere close to there. And the reason that they did that was because in those breakfast alcoves, usually they would have a big, massive round table and, you know, they would pull people in and do seances in those tables. Um, the, the phone contact or connection actually was a safeguard. It wasn't necessarily so they could call up and hear the spirit. Why they would put those rooms in conjunction with each other was because um, as they're doing the seance, sometimes you get unruly spirits, you know, instead of it coming through being the loved one that that person wants to hear, you get something that starts to do massive paranormal activity, right? So the phone actually was a distraction, like they would use that uh, as a form or means to control unruly spirits. They would call them then to that place you know, get their attention and that allowed them to close whatever portal or door they had opened in the room above. Um, at some of the other, like some of the major castles where that happens, uh, they also have a few other safeguards um, because sometimes you get in these, you know, seances or different things that they're going to do, you get witches and warlocks that are going to fight with each other and um, so they would have the rooms with the multiple, multiple mirrors and they would put the sisters of light who were the, you know, um, there's two kind of security teams. Many of them would have protectors who were their own personal protectors. Um, usually the protectors, you know, maybe one or two of the highest elite would have their protectors in the room with them. But the majority of the time there, you know, it's just understood that there's only certain places you can battle. And if you have a problem with an individual, um, you know, you can't just come out in a random room and attack that person. Like you have to go, you know, pull, pull them into the different, ba you know, designated battlefields for your uh, level within the system. Um, but they would have the Sisters of Light there as backup for some of the different rituals that they would be doing. And so they would be sitting in, you know, a nice living room that is filled with mirrors and that's so that, you know, they could help protect, but also um, they would be watching. Um, so they're going to be using those mirrors to watch the property. They're going to be watching for any random uh, people who are coming onto the property. Uh, they're going to know what's going on in almost every single room in that palace or mansion because there's that mirror connection. So, you know, they could even make sure if, you know, the, that palace had slaves or uh, servants that were serving um, they're going to make sure that no random servant is just wandering through the hall, wandering into this ritual. Um, so, so it gets what, really interesting. What you're saying, sorry, what you're saying is in order for them to look through the mirrors, they don't actually have to be there. They can be looking remotely from another location. Right. So the, what what do they need to connect to the mirror? How do they connect to the mirror? Is that all just done via the sorcery or is there yeah, anything just physical? through sorcery and um, it's, you know, they have something that allows them that, that spiritual access. access. Okay. Um, 
you know, these people have learned to use their, the glory or the light that God's given them. And, you know, what is magic? It's basically entangling with something at that uh, quantum or molecular level. So, um, you know, we're talking magic with a K, uh, like, you know, the elite spell it not magic with a C, which is more of illusions, uh, tricks, you know, kind of a sleight of the hand, um, distractions of the eye. Um, With real magic, you know, Solomonic, uh, Enochian, blood magic, um, you know, these people know how to transfer their state of body where, um, you know, they can turn into that spirit state and, uh, you know, enter into that spirit world through these portals or doorways. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So it gets, it gets interesting. Um, you know, one of the castles I spent the most time at uh, for ritual prep was uh, Nurschwanstein or Neuschwanstein or... Um, <laughs> Nerfenstein, as I call it. <laughs> we can call it whatever. But, um, you know, I grew up just calling it Nerf, uh, Nerfenstein. So, um, you know, with that one, the layout's very interesting. Um, you know, a lot of the ritual prep was done in that in that main tower off of that main entrance. Um, there's a massive sanctuary in there when you go in it's actually not that big um but that's what you know they've got the painted ceiling with uh the you know the thousand lights um you know and that was the access portal uh when you're doing magic in there that literally would open up at night where you know you wouldn't see the ceiling instead you would see the sky and you would see the stars um you know so they uh, you know the probably the it was one of the first rituals where you know i i was about five years old and um you know i just remember being walking up that stairwell um to the upper room in the tower and it you know didn't necessarily look like it looks now um in fact, like now they have that stairwell kind of painted in some areas I've seen, but I just remember, you know, it kind of being cementy um, looking and they had us, um, you know, walking in groups of two and, um, you know, there were sisters of lights and then the mothers of darkness. And that was the only one, usually they don't allow uh, males up there, and I'm not sure why they particularly allowed my training partner up there, but he was the only male that was up there. And they had him stationed right uh, next to the door as you come in. And I think that was because, you know, they knew they were going to be summoning um, a spirit, which was actually Ashtaroth or as they called her at that time, the queen of the dead. And they were trying to connect me to that queen of the dead. Um, And I think they wanted him close to that door so that if she attacked, like they could literally just shove him out. Um, But, um, you know, so they drew a, a pentagram on the middle of the floor and that's what they had laid me down in. You know, and at first as a kid, you have, you know, they don't sit there and say, okay, now you're going to lay on the floor and, you know, this good fairy is going to come and, you know, you really want to talk with her and make a connection. You know, they don't tell you anything. Um, you know, I'm just laying in this pentagram and, you know, there's candles, all the sisters of light are, you know, singing and, you know, I see this ceiling open up and I can actually see the stars and you're kind of like, cool, like what's happening, you know? Next thing I know, I hear this little scratching sound and I, you know, I sit up and I'm watching this evil looking, you know, grotesque thing come through the ground. I mean, she looked like a gross mummy. Um, 
And I was just like, oh, heck no. You know, it's like, no, 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 that's not going to happen. And as she came out and started coming at me, like I literally stood up in that, you know, pentagram. And I, the only words that would come to my mouth were one of the songs that I knew uh, that was the B-I-B-L-E. And I just started singing, you know, the, you know, actually I was speaking at the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. And, you know, I kept going at her with that song because she recoiled. And so, you know, that connection was not made. Now, what's interesting is that part of the title for the Queen Mother of Darkness is they'll be called the Queen of Heaven, which is also a term that the Catholic Church uses to speak about Mother Mary. Um, so that's kind of ironic, isn't it? Um, but the Queen of Heaven is is literally, you know, the host at times uh, for Ashtaroth. So that's when they use that term is when they're opening themselves up to be that host for Ashtaroth. Um, so they, you know, there's that duality that they put between the good, supposed good and the evil. Um, so that was one of the rituals. Um, I remember like as we came up and then went down the stairway, um, you know, we all had candles in our hands and we had ropes on, um, you know, as we walked in twos up that stairway and it's a pretty tight stairway. Um, you know, but everything is so methodical. You have this group of women, you know, going up that stairway together. Um, underneath ground in that area, I've talked about, um, like, you know, that underground, there's this massive battle arena. And um, like the side of that arena wall is actually the cliff wall or the cliff face on the one side and it looks out to that area uh, where there's kind of a split um, to you know it's like kind of two pieces of the mountain there and I can remember as a kid that they used to have a wooden bridge that went across that expanse and I would absolutely pitch a fit like I did not want to have to walk across that bridge and, you know, the wind would blow. And at certain points, because it was wood pallets on the bridge, it would make this clanking sound when the wood would blow. So, um, you know, as the wood hit the face front for that cliff, or I'll say for both sides of that expanse, maybe be a better picture. And uh, they had like kind of a dual um, it was, it was smaller in length, but they had a similar wood bridge like that in Yellowstone. And there was a spiritual connection between the two areas. And, um, you know, so I had gone through some different things with, you know, the wood bridge there at Nurse, uh, Nurse And then we went to Yellowstone for a family trip and, you know, my proctor and family were trying to get me on that bridge. And I was like, no. And what had happened was that I had, I would have visions, um, you know, that I didn't know the fullness of, of what I was seeing, you know, or how to handle it. But I had had a specific vision that somebody was going to die. And um, so you know, I was just like, no, like, I'm not going on that. And um, the one in Yellowstone, again, like I absolutely, I refused and, you know, threw the biggest fit. And a week later, they took a, a school trip with a classroom of children across. And one of those children fell off and died. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that was, and it was after, shortly after that was when they actually made the more solid, secure bridges. They took those wood bridges down. Um, but I can remember that. And so that arena, um, the windows were a little higher up, but you could, um, 
if you're up on some of the archways that uh, like around the arena on the the one side it's got like a two level archway and that second level like a lot of the sisters of light um, would sit in those archways during the battles and they also would usually have candles and lights um, like the swinging lights and so you know that would be the light that was coming into that area if the battle was later at night um, so it would always have kind of like this misty dark feel to it um, they would also some of them would have <clears throat> incense like the incense balls that the priest in the catholic church uses so they would be putting frankincense in the air, which then would also give it that kind of foggy type look in there um, as they were doing their battles. Um, what type of battles? What type of battles took place there? Can you tell us? Yeah, it would be uh, usually battles for positions. Um, you know, so if it was a high priest or priestess that was wanting to graduate to become a grand high priest or priestess you know like if somebody was older and was stepping down or somebody had died um then they could uh battle to see who would step into that position um so it's always offered when ever somebody you know dies or steps down that that position or seat or the quadrant becomes open. Um, some of the other things with that, you had the, like I witnessed the protector battle there. Um, you know, I only experienced the one, so I'm not sure when they decide to do that or how often that happens. Um, you kind of have some different things with that. I'll say like the, specific one I I witnessed um, you know they were pos battling for positions so you had three different levels of protectors you had you know the ones who were active protectors who were adults you had the ones that had already been through some of the training that were called the junior protectors um, you know they were kind of like their teenage to young adult years and then you had the children uh, that were being trained into those, uh, being trained into that position. And they were on teams. So, you know, it was like you had an adult, a junior and a child um, all on one team. And then they were battling each other, um, you know, and it, I think it just kind of gave authority or jurisdiction right. Um, you know, one of the individuals I've named who uh, was the Wheaton chief of police at the time, that's what I knew him as. Um, he was the head protector at that time. And, uh, you know, the end of that battle, it came down to him and my training partner. And uh, that's when my training partner ended up, uh, he beat him in battle and he became the head protector. So, um, and he was how old? Your training? He was partner? seven. He was about seven years old. Can and you, we have to remember you, that his grandfather, you know, was our lead or was our defense um, magic trainer. Um, he was a Nazi, and that was Michael Carcock. So, um, you know, we went through intense training with that, um, Matt, or with defense at defense magic and. Uh, different forms of combat, uh, stuff like that. So Harry Potter. Yeah. And it wasn't, yeah. When I say combat, we're not talking necessarily physical, even though there was a lot of physical, um, combat that we were put through, but the, you know, the majority of it was connected with different forms of dark magic you know, that was used in protection or in offense. So so who would who would watch these battles? I mean, is this like a, a red carpet do? I would imagine like the carpet's out and everyone comes in their little long black, whatever it is they're wearing, 
Um, and not necessarily position. black. It depended on uh, their position and and what uh, the ritual or the battle was about. Um, you know, they could be in white if uh, there were hidden. You know, what I found out later were the hidden marriage ceremonies that were going on. Um, you know, they would fight for sometimes for certain vows or covenants between one another. Um, it could be red, uh, you know, the Sisters of Light. Uh, they have three different outfits. Actually, a lot of, I'll just say, all the members had usually three different robes. Um, you know, so it just depended on what you were called to, which one you would wear. But they were either uh, red, black, or or white for the ones that I was used to. And sometimes some had gold or green or blue. Uh, when I saw those ones, usually they were uh, more like a witch's cloak. And usually they were made out of a velvet type material. Um, like for me, uh, there were times like when I was in certain areas, like when I first started off as, um, you know, areas that in the military that were connected to CERN, um, they would have me dressed in this little outfit that I, I mean, it was like one of my favorites. Um, I didn't know the full extent of all the meaning with it until later. Um, but that was one of the times like, you know, I had to wear my hair, um, you know, try to have it straight and they would try to, you're going to laugh at this part, Chantel, because we've talked about the hair, but, you know, it's like they would try to have like my hair, you know, was short and they try to have it so that it would like, you know, curl and like be flat like that on my face. Right. And I had this bleach blonde hair, um, but my hair did not work that way. The one side refused to curl all nice and curl in. And instead I'd get like this wispy stuff that went up, right? And it didn't help that my training partner, he would sit there and he would like, all of a sudden he'd like go like that with my hair, which then would make it more static and more wispy, right? And I would look at him and just be like, you know? And I'd be in this blue velvet, uh, the outfit that they had found for me, I was the only one that had kind of like a V neck in mine. And, um, and it had like some little, um, like a little cat pattern on it that you could barely see, but it was there, you know? So I thought I had this cute little outfit with a little kitty on it. And uh, it had come with a skirt and, a, and pants. And I liked it because I hated wearing those, you know, the dresses when I had to wear them in the system. So, uh, you know, it was like, yes, I get my little blue velvet pants and I get to wear my little boots and, you know, not the little patent dress shoes that they'd have, you know, make me wear with those lacy socks, you know, <laughs> um, that would drive me crazy. And they eventually went to tights because they couldn't keep me in those socks. You know, it was like, no, those don't go with those shoes. And I hated those you know, I still think the only reason they have those patent shoes, here's the deal. When you walk with those things across like wood floors or, um, you know, kind of that, you know, uh, not wax, but that's the, you know, polished cement, right? What do those little patent shoes do? They collect static electricity. And I think that's really the only reason they have all those little girls wear those shoes is because it it creates this environment with a lot of static when they're all together. Um, I believe you know, that. Wow. <laughs> so, I mean, it's horrible. So, um, but what really wow. what the purpose was, was with those, with that blue velvet, um, you know, I found out later that they would, that a lot of times uh, in, especially the Norwegian hierarchy, uh, which, you know, I was Norwegian bloodline as well. Um, you know, my father's side is Norwegian. So that's where, you know, I connected back some of the, uh, you know, 
witchcraft stemming from my dad's side, even though his family was not active in it, they still had descendants that went back, but uh, they would, so they used this as part of my cover as a child, especially when I started working in the military, um, because, you know, they hid me in that Masonic system as a little boy, even though I wasn't, um, like they wouldn't necessarily advertise or say that, but for those who didn't know, you know, who I was, um, they would see me with all these groups of little boys and were all dressed in the blue velvet shirt and, you know, the pants and stuff. And so they, they didn't catch that. Oh my gosh, that's actually, you know, the, the little queen successor, mother of darkness. So when I didn't have the robes on, um, often they would kind of like try to blend me in. So it wasn't there, you know, I'll clarify, um, there wasn't any gender stuff going on for me. Uh, they weren't trying to push that. It simply was with their cover. They would try to bring me into these programs with a group of, of boys initially. Um, and that was for the looking glass experiments. And then as I graduated further, that's when girls started to be added. Um, and then there was like no more hiding my identity. Um, so think about that, you know, where is the, the looking glass experiments are highly connected to uh, CERN, which at the time uh, was primarily run out of Switzerland. Um, you know, so when you look back, you'll even see Switzerland because of that Scandinavian descent, uh, they would often dress the little boys in that blue velvet too. So that was part of the, you know, I, I'm not sure of the full extent of that, but it's just kind of funny thinking back, you know. Um, and then, you know, during those times too, instead of my ritual name, uh, which was Sunshine, you know, they would still sometimes refer to that, but uh, they actually, you know, hid my name even where they would uh, call me Sunny and use my protector's uh, last name when they were referring to me if they used a full name and made it seem like we were brothers. So um, in the lodges and stuff, um, you know, that's how they would refer to me. So it, it gets really interesting why, why they did you? certain yes, things. Goodness. Well, there was actually, there's more to that. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing is that, you know, the sun in that culture, you know, what are they really doing? They're honoring the sun and the moon. Uh, they're getting into all sorts of, you know, in their magic uh, worship of created things. And, um, who was, you know, the god of the system um, for the majority of the world? They made it, you know, look like, you know, that connection to, to Ra or the sun god. Um, so most people, you know, that were kind of lower levels at that time, they're expecting that the head of that system is going to be male or masculine. Uh -huh. um, so that was part of, they hid you know, the, the truth of what was going on at, for the lower levels, um, you know, yet as you get to the mid levels, the majority, you know, those high priest or priestesses, they didn't know exactly who the mothers of darkness were, but they would see them appear at rituals. You know, they would come in the four times a year when everybody's together, um, you know, very distinctly those mothers are going to march in together and take their seats at thrones. And then Satan would appear and take his seat on a throne. Um, so they would see that procession. Um, so those procession, you know, that arena down in Nershvastein, um, sometimes you would see um, that, uh, you know, the gathering for some of the different rituals. Um, 
or ritual events, or if he wanted to come for a certain battle, um, some of the brides of Satan would engage in those battles for positions, and that's more where you would see uh, Satan appear for some of those battles. Wow. Just... Yeah. So oh. then I want to get into a fun story, but I'll let you make your comments first. <laughs> No, I'm just fascinated by that. You know, um, it's amazing. Yeah, we sit in this world oblivious to these things going on. You know, it kind of happens in storybooks with Hansel and Gretel. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> not right in front of us, but very fascinating. Yes, I know you've got some very cool stories as well about this, those uh, times. So please share. Yeah. So some of the other castles, um, you know, I was there during times for ritual hunts. We've talked about those. Um, you know, some of the elites, um, they may not use a castle at that time per se, uh, but they would have hunting lodges that would be connected or land, um, you know, that would be forested areas that would be uh, connected to uh, those castle areas and like when you looked at kind of the layout a lot of um like especially in the england area or you know scotland ireland it would build the land areas where they would have a castle or a palace or a mansion and that would be where you know whoever had the title or the authority over that land they're gonna reside in that castle and then you know there would be other homes or buildings that are going to be built in that property and those would be the people who you know were hired to work the land or uh, caretakers for the palace or the mansion and um, you know so what would happen is that sometimes with these you know big massive hunts they had to ensure that you know the people that they were hiring either were very distracted on days that they're going to have that or you know they were aware that those hunting parties were taking place um you know i i, I believe that the majority of those workers very quickly found out you know what was going on in in order to survive or live you know they had to accept what was going on and just be thankful that they weren't, uh, you know, being put into those hunts. Um, you know, so some of those houses, and I guess why I brought that up is because um, some of those houses were places that people who kind of escaped out of the main perimeters for those hunts would try to run. So, you know, later, I would run into people who had survived the hunts and it was because they would, you know, find or get their way into some place uh, that was around, but it just meant then that they would uh, be put back into those hunts at another time. There's no, so, there's no escape, is there? There's really no escape. No. And if they did, you know, they would just be put back in at a later time or season. Um, you know, some of them became quite good, which then they were kind of the prized, you know, stag for those hunts where, uh, you know, the elites would target them all the more because they they really um, took pleasure in that wickedness of, of hunting. Um, you know, so just a moment to reflect on that, you know, God bless each of those majors, you know, survivors that endured more than one hunt. Um, but, um, you know, so <clears throat> certain times of the years, um, you know, the bigger mansions, palaces, they would put on those hunts, um, you know, and it was one of those, and it, I just know, I don't know where it was, but I know it was a Rothschild property. And it was more of a, you know, the outside, I remember being that gray stone, um, you know, a very elaborate kind of palace or mansion. But at the same time, it was kind of what I would say more of the 
like the outside of it, you know, looked more like a fortress kind of. And as you, like there were two front doors uh, to this place. One was kind of off to the side and then it had the more elaborate door, which as people came in for the parties, um, they would drive up and they would be let out and they would go into this big, you know, foyer that then opened up into bigger rooms um, where, you know, not like bedrooms or living rooms. It was more like the social where there were like, you'd go towards the back and there would be like this big ballroom type area that would open up into the, the back gardens. Um, so that side door though, that actually, um, like when you went in that, uh, there were, uh, these cement type stairs or stone stairs that would go down into this long hallway that had these old doors on each side. And, uh, those older doors were kind of, I guess what I would say, you know, I'd seen them in some of the older Catholic churches, uh, where it was, you know, these big, heavy, thick wood doors, uh, that then had actual metal on the doors in the shape of a cross. And, um, you know, so I just remember there was at least, you know, there was a couple doors on each side. Um, and then if you went up, like at that foyer, there also was a stairwell that went up, um, and it was kind of like a half stairwell. It wasn't as long as the other one. And that went into those, like a hallway that connected to that main entrance area. So anyway, that was the door that the children were allowed to go in and out of. And like I've explained before, we would always use encyclopedia who was a Rothschild to give us the tour. So, you know, he had given us a tour and had just kind of mentioned that hallway and told us a story about that there was a graveyard down there. And that um, he told us the name of the individual um, who supposedly, you know, had been a single um, older man, more like a priest and had said that, um, you know, there was something about a toy and that, you know, he had described the toy that it was like this carved out old little wood horse that had been painted white and, um, you know, that there had been a little soldier that could go on top of that horse and that, you know, a little boy who had lived in the past uh, the palace had died. He was about three, maybe four. And so when he died, they buried that horse with him. And, you know, he'd even told us that for whatever reason, the little boy had been buried in that grave with the old man. And we're like, what? You know, but of course, then you've got little, call them little big brown eyes, you know, who is the little one-year-old that we would, um, you know, because when they did these hunting parties, you you would have the expendable kids that would be released outside. So the elite who were able to go after the expendable kids uh, would be doing that. But then you had the older elite that, you know, may, um, may have been losing some of their ability. You know, they're not as fast. They're not as agile. And so they didn't stop the hunting things what they would do inside is, um, you know, the, the hierarchy children, like they weren't allowed to be killed, but those older men and women would then hunt them. And if they caught you, you would, you know, quickly find yourself in a bad position where they're, you know, raping you, doing sex magic. Um, so, you know, that was the perimeters of the game. So whenever we were there, we were always in the inside of the house and, you know, me and my training partner automatically would go for little, you know, little brown eyes because he was just, you know, a little guy, he was just like one. And, you know, so we would, we would then hide him with us wherever we were. Um, so, you know, he hears the story and he's like, I want the horse. 
So of course, you know, we had to comply because he's just, you know, those big brown eyes. Um, he was so sweet. And so we decide to, you know, make this little escapade and go adventuring. And sure enough, you know, we, and we didn't do it with encyclopedia. You know, we waited till he had wandered off. So it was just um, me and my training partner, uh, one of the other Rothschild boys and brown eyes. And, uh, you know, we go escapading down there and uh, we find, sure enough, there's a graveyard. So when we got that, it was, you know, along the left side of that wall, we, we got that opened and uh, it, it was very interesting because it was almost like all these like uh, bigger pebbles. So the whole floor under there and it extended wide underneath the house. Uh, so you had this, you know, big graveyard down there with multiple graves and all of it's like in these pebbles that are the top. It had, it was laid out where, you know, you have walkways and then, you know, there would be like squ squares that would have like six uh, graves. Um, you'd have three on one side and three on the other facing each other. Um, so I don't know if they were buried in, you know, family units or kind of how that worked. Um, but anyway, we find the one with the name on it, just like Encyclopedia said. So we were excited. And um, the way that the headstone was, like it was this, um, you know, massive uh, cement, or I'm not sure what the material is, but it's like this slab of stone that's laid over the grave. And then you have like a, a stone uh, uh, cophicus that the body's laid in in that area and stuff. And so we, we jimmied off that stone and had got it, like we couldn't get it all the way off, but we had just got it enough to the side so that we could see in. And I just remember the first, you know, as we, we pushed and we got that um, kind of off to the side, we saw that there was, um, that this man, like it was this old, his clothing was kind of like this I don't even know what the material was, but it was like this white kind of uh, tea colored uh, type of material. And he had red shoes on, red leather shoes. So that was very interesting. Um, you know, up until then, we didn't see a lot of individuals that wore those shoes. Um, but that, that was interesting. And so sure enough, there was uh, two skeletons in there. And the one was a small one, and we did find that toy. Um, you know, after we didn't necessarily get caught down there, what happened um, was that all of a sudden, like in the back, back part of that graveyard, we all of a sudden started hearing this roaring of a of an evil spirit and it was like this like oh you know that was getting louder and we just looked at each other and it's like we got to get out of here but um one of the boys with us he was like you gotta uh, i think uh encyclopedia had come down at that time and had found us and he started you know pitching a fit and was like you gotta put it back you gotta put it back and and we're like oh no 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 this is ours and <laughs> We, we start to hear this spirit and we're like, we got to get out of here. And he's like, no, no, you got to put everything back like it was. So we're trying to push that slab back in the place before, you know, we have this confrontation of whatever's coming. We finally start running out and he's like, you got to lock the door. You got to lock the door. And we're like, forget locking the door. And he's like, no, you got to lock it. And, uh, so we're trying to lock it and stuff. And then he goes running with the light. And so, um, you know, so then at least me and um, my training partner and little James at that time, you know, down there in the dark and we're trying to lock this door. And then we turn and I could feel little, you know, um, brown eyes hair. So I'm like, 
try to run with my hand on top of his head and his shoulders, you know, in front of me, kind of pushing him. And then I've got my training partner behind me pushing me. And we're like trying not to trip over each other. And we finally <laughs> get like up into that main platform where the door was. And luckily, like, encyclopedia had stopped there and he had opened that door a little ways and he saw his dad coming through or coming to that top stairwell so just as we get up and we kind of turn he shuts that door and his dad's like what are you guys up to and we're all like oh nothing we just came in from outside <laughs> so it was like the timing on some of that stuff was you know <laughs> <laughs> we would have been creamed if we had been caught with that. Later, I did see the toy. I think that the boys got caught with it because later um, it was in uh, Jacob Rothschild's library. He, he put that on his shelves. And so very interesting. Well, we are yeah. going to take a little ad break uh, before we go any further. For that. So, Borne, if you can just get that for us. Thank you. I am a natural health practitioner. I usually don't endorse any technical product, but this is something special. And that's why I wanted to say a few words about this. It's called the Mini Magic, and it works on electromagnetic pulses that actually have such an effect on our body to rejuvenate the cells. And there is a lot of scientific research behind it. So, I started using it one day when I really got severe headache and I would put these two round things on my back here and I would go to bed and rest and sleep. So within half an hour or an hour, I felt my headache goes down and in three hours I was ready actually to get up and it was late in the night but I was still hungry so I got up and I didn't have any more headache. So that's one of the experiences I recommend for everybody to use it. But I have to tell you, my mom, she used, she's been using it for about five days now. And she had a finger that could not move. And she's generally in very, very good health. She's in her early 80s. One of her fingers could not move. Uh, after a night of putting this on, for the first time in a decade, she can move her fingers. Um, not only that, what really impressed me, and over the, few, uh, the, the next few days, there, she placed it on her bladder, her back, and within a few, a few hours, she was fine. But more than anything, I got to see how her energy changed. She's a vibey mama. What can I say? <laughs> I'm glad she was able to get up and around and not have any pain. And her fingers are moving. And guess which finger it was? The wedding ring finger. Wow. <laughs> and now it's perfect. It's amazing. It's incredible, actually. Anyway, I would love to hear. Um, I'm just checking the time here. Uh, we have another show actually after this on solutions. So I'm wondering, we were going to do the white rabbit as well, Jess. How yep. much time do we need for that? Or should we keep that for next time maybe? Um, I'm going to... Yeah. because we still got keep another... that for next time. In... Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask you then maybe just to wrap up with something again from the castles. Um, interesting. I had one question, and I know we've we've touched on this before as well, but I'd like clarity again. In those battles that uh, that happen at these castles, obviously there's a lot of wounding and what have you that goes on. And you've often told us in the past that uh, they, these wounds are healed by the. <laughs> All the little hands. Actually, it was more like who? <laughs> Flying around <laughs> with their little ones and go zap, zap. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering, A, do, do people actually get killed like dead, 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 like dead, real dead in these battles and get brought back to life? Or do they get killed and then 
can't get brought back to life, but then get told that it was a heart attack or an accident, or especially if it's a well-known person. I'm just interested to know how do they so, deal so with that? Yes, um, yes, uh, depending on the situation. And if, um, you know, you got to remember that these people are, are fighting for power and, uh, you know, power over their region, their area. Um, so, you know, I, I witnessed a lot of, uh, I guess the overall emotion towards each other would be disdain. Uh, you know, they had that fakey nice where, you know, they would make alliances. They would, um, you know, you'd have your covenants, your vows, your contracts with others. Um, what that did was, you know, those that aligned with you, then you would be able to use them or um, their spirits that they worked with uh, in battles or to help yourself if somebody was coming against you. Um, but, you know, this is the biggest world for betrayal. You know, th they really, they'd make these alliances and contracts, but really, you know, they're not, um, you know, loyal to anybody except for themselves you know they always will guard and protect themselves above all else so um mm. yeah so it could be both um or all those things that you mentioned mm. wow yeah. so very, very yeah i'm not big mm. on that fakey nice you know yeah i i actually found out later in life that that was why you know, I grew up with so much of that where, you know, they would be giving each other compliment, compliments, but it's almost like they're gritting their teeth and their their compliments would be, you know, like the one I would get all the time was, you know, my, aren't you, you know, don't you have a memory like an elephant or, you know, and I would get that because I would be repeating back stuff that they didn't want me to repeat back. Um, but it wasn't necessarily a, a good thing, um, you know, so yeah. they would give those fake compliments, especially about beauty or people's appearances or looks. But behind it was the coveting, uh, the jealousy, the envy, um, the hatred. You know, you knew that if they had the opportunity, they'd be ripping that beautiful dress off that person just to have, you know, just so nobody had the dress. Um, <laughs> you know, so it's yeah. like, um, you know, I, I realized later, like I had, I have trouble, you know, giving compliments just because it was something I wouldn't do because I saw so much fakeness of it, yeah. you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Wow. Wow, Jess, another amazing show. And I'm sorry, guys, I did think we were going to be doing Alice today, but you're going to have to wait for next have one. To wait. Just think how exciting that's going to be. We've had a fantastic show today anyway. So please catch us at uh, 4.30, which is now four or well, 5 to 4 yeah, for us. So we're going to take a half an hour breather. And then you're going to catch us on Solutions with Aquarius Rising Africa, where Jess will be talking <clears throat> about the importance of testimonies and survivors and overcomers actually sharing your testimonies at the moment, or not only at the moment. Yeah. It is so important because a lot of the survivors are being silenced right now, mm -hmm. and there's a huge, massive army of harassers out there that are completely annihilating a lot of the voices. So this is a very important topic um, because the more voices that are heard, the more people that speak, the more safe people like Jesse is, uh, you yeah. know, the more the testimonies get out there. And just please, on that, that note, let's please just keep Tom Altaus in our prayers. He's having a really rough time at the moment regarding this type of stuff as well. So even more reason why we talk about this topic. So please join us at 4.30. I don't know, Jess, what time will that be for you again? Uh, 
We'll just say 9.30 Eastern. Okay, 9.30 Eastern time, 4.30 GMT plus two. And on that note, Jess, th Jess thank you so much. Won't you just end for us in prayer, please? Absolutely. Father, we thank you that um, we can look back at our past, at our experiences, and we can um, pick out the good things, the memories, that it's okay to um, have those moments of laughter, uh, those moments that are more lighthearted. We thank you for those, and I thank you um, that I'm able to impart some of the knowledge, some of the inner workings of the system and the meanings behind things. So I ask as we go out, Lord, that you would just continue to bring that healing, that you would continue to bring every individual to the place where they're able to use their um, their life stories and experiences um, as a blessing to others or as a means to help others through their situations. Um, let us be mindful to build one another up, to invest in one another, and to help each other to become uh, the best that we can be. So we thank you for that, and we ask for that in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Beautiful. Thank you, Jess. Right. Blessings. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to our uh, beautiful viewers. Always such a pleasure to have you guys up joining us here. Love, love to see you in the chat. Scotty, Colleen, Courtney, all the... And there's someone in Japanese or some Oriental. Hmm. I don't understand. You always have a very pretty face. And I like that you're always giving beautiful comments. I don't know what your name is. I have no idea how to pronounce it. Let me see you. <laughs> Thank you so much. God bless you guys. Mwah. Take good care of yourselves. If you haven't already, please just like, share, subscribe. These are so many important things to share um, at this time. Let's keep the faith. Let's stay together. Let's put out the positive vibes and um, we'll get through this. God bless you all. Yeah. See you soon on Solutions. Jerry Bye. <laughs> <laughs>